Good morning, again. We're looking at different churches, and to the church at Ephesus, Jesus says, you're patient. I commend you for that. But you've lost your first love. To the church at Smyrna, Jesus says, really nothing negative. He just says, tribulations are coming. Suffering is coming. And that seems to fly in the face of at least some preaching out there. Um, I, I don't actually think I've ever watched one full sermon that was on TV. But I know that some of those sermons can tend to be like, if you have faith, and you, you believe the right things, and you send in some money, you will have straight teeth, you, nothing will happen in your life. There can be that very you know, prosperity gospel where you think you become a Christian so that life turns better. It's a good investment. That's completely false. Jesus says, expect tribulation, expect suffering to the church at Smyrna. There at Pergamum, uh, the church was tolerating the teaching of Baal. And last week we looked at the Baal worship, not really the Baal worship, the emperor worship, and how many people in Pergamum would have lost their jobs if they aren't there to offer the right sacrifices and how much pressure that would put on the church to just go along with it. And we, we made the comment last week, it's small compromises. This, the, just giving in a little bit, it's not a big deal. And after a while, we find ourselves in a dark wood and um, not knowing where we, how we uh, came to such uh, a delusion. Well... Today, if you want to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, we're going to look at Thyatira. And the I, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I've titled my sermon. I think you have a handout, I guess. Uh, yeah, Kek, Kick Jezebel Out. And as we have always been doing, there's something positive that Jesus commends the church at Thyatira. Then he says, but I have this against you. And then he has a, a, an encouragement of how to remedy the situation. And we're going to look at those three moves, those three, uh, three points. Uh, let's read Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And this is Jesus talking through John the, the scribe in a way. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refused, but she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the children, I'm sorry, and all the churches will know that I am 
he who searches the mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who do not learn what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and the one and verse 26 the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end to him I will give authority over nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken into pieces even as I myself have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here's the compliment, and I, again, I want to listen to this letter and take inventory of ourselves. The first thing is the positive. The positive thing is you're patient, you're enduring, and here's something that is, I think, rather remarkable. You are growing. Your latter works are greater than the first. You're a growing church, and I commend you for it. You know, how many times do we see churches that don't grow, or how many times do we see Christians that stagnate, that plateau, and we get concerned? Development is arrested. Jesus says, you're growing, and you're being patient. And I made this point before, I think it was with the first letter to the church at Ephesus. Sometimes your virtues or your, your good qualities can become <clears throat> um, can produce bad qualities. I probably should have said that better, but I didn't. You're patient to a fault, is the point. Here's what I have against you, Thyatira. You tolerate Jezebel, the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And I want to stop here and kind of do what we did last week. Who is this figure, Jezebel? I'm not convinced, like the teaching of Balaam, I think Balaam wasn't actually a name they had. I think it was, it was a, a figure of something that was, and uh, it was the figure of Balaam in the Old Testament. Jezebel, I suspect, is not a name of one of the women there. But he's talking about Jezebel of the Old Testament. I want us to think through what did Jezebel do in the Old Testament. And if we want to go to 1 Kings and turn your Bibles to 1 Kings uh, 16 and kind of figure out who is Jezebel. In your handout, I have a question. It's question number two. What are three characteristics of the figure Jezebel? And we're going to look at uh, the three of them that I've kind of thought through. The what, characteristic number one, she brings sin into the house. Okay, Jezebel brings, her first character, characteristic is that she brings sin into the house. I probably should turn my Bible there. First Kings... 16. Let's we'll start reading in verse 30 when Ahab marries her. Uh, 1 Kings 16, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had not been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king 
of the Sidonians and went and served Baal and worshipped him. This is what Ahab does. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger more than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Jezebel is a princess of a pagan king. And what does she do? She brings sin into Israel. And she has Ahab erect these idols, these temples for Baal, and that disturbs his focus. And we're going to see. I mean, we had maybe a half a year ago, we had an adults class going through the divided kingdom, and we looked at Jezebel. Uh, Ahab's a pretty weak character. We're going to see him cry in a second when he wants Naboth's vineyard. Um, he, he's, a, he's a really pathetic figure. Jezebel is running the show. And we know, I'll just reference it, I think it's in 1 Kings 19, where Elijah kills how many prophets of Baal? 450. And what does Jezebel do? She's like, I'm going to go kill him. I'm going to take uh, Elijah out. Why? Because those prophets were Jezebel's. <laughs> Jezebel owned those prophets in a way. It was her God. She's the one that brought Baal worship in to Israel. What does Jezebel do? She brings sin into the house. Number two, what does she do? She kicks God's word out. She kicks God's word out. She, she kicks God out of the house. Uh, in 1 Kings 18, verse 4, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Jezebel not only brings in waves of Baal prophets, Jezebel starts to kill the prophets of Israel. And so those are the two things. First, she brings sin into the house. Secondly, she kicks God out of the house. And thirdly, I'm just going to say, she's just a bad person. <laughs> she's just evil. Uh, again, I, I don't think people are, people today don't really name their kids Jezebel. I think that would be a horrible name to give a child. Uh, growing up, my best friend's dog was Jezebel. <laughs> it was a black lab, and it, it really tells you what we thought about the dog. Um, what an evil name. She's generally thought of as a prostitute, but it's not really she's in prostitution, but she is bringing in gods for Israel to prostitute themselves with. Let's go to 1 Kings 21. With Naboth's vineyard, verse 25 and 20. Six. In my Bible, this is a parenthetical thought. So 1 Kings 21, verse 25. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done among the Lord uh, whom the Lord had cast out before the people of Israel. Again, just Jezebel is a bad person. I hope that's answering the, the question number uh, two on the handout. Now, here's the point. Let's go back to... Now we have the figure of Jezebel in our minds. Let's go back to Revelation chapter two. It's not Jezebel that's the issue. I, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Jezebel is the issue. People aren't acting like Jezebel. That's not the issue. 
Let's see what the issue is. Verse 20. But I have this against you, Thyatira, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now let's stop here. This prophetess brings in sexual immorality into the church. The issue is the church was tolerating the woman. The idea is sin is not to be tolerated within the church. Again, last week we looked at the dangers of compromising there's some small steps you can start making to get in bed with culture that Christians are supposed to stand up against. This is a little bit different. This is a flagrant violation inside the church. And what are people doing? They're just saying they're acknowledging it. And the text says they're being patient. I want to stop here for a second and really think through the application for the church here. Um, I would say to the elders specifically, we need to know what's being taught in this, uh, not we, you. You all need to be um, aware of what's being taught and that false teaching, specifically flagrant immoral teaching, is not being tolerated in this church. Um, I'm uh, unaware of anything um, like this. But this Jezebel character seems to be persuading some people at least not to just uh, reject her. I, I'm personally really concerned when I see Members of the church not test certain teachings. Um, and one thing specifically is, I guess something that I just, I, I get concerned about is when wives aren't thinking autonomously or husbands are not thinking autonomously, but they lean on each other in a crutch. And I'm saying that because I don't need to say the individual's name. Down in Mississippi, though, there was an individual who was preaching for a church, and I don't think I would be, this would be inappropriate for me to say, this was perhaps one of Julie's favorite preachers of all time. This guy was very gifted, um, and he, he got into, uh, I, I believe, Calvinism. And he started having a view of God that God was some kind of puppet master and God is pulling the strings to everything. And that's what his view was. And throughout time, he, he, I think now he's preaching for a Presbyterian church and he was pulled away. Now those things happen. What breaks my heart is when you see his family follow him hook, line, and sinker. I tell Julie, we were walking the other day, we, we, sometimes we walk down to the Des Moines River and we walk back, talking about this figure. How can I raise my family in a way where that we are independent, that we are thinking through God's word, but that she is able to base teaching off of scripture and not off of me? Or how other people are able to base their views on scripture and not other people. And that we as a church at Madrid have a certain kind of culture that we compel, that, that we, we nudge people to be autonomous and to look at scripture instead of being swayed by certain personalities. I'm not saying that's purely the reason people go into false teaching. But I'm saying we as a church need to Beware of Jezebel figures 
and to have a way to undermine their teaching. I, uh, that story, I know recently there's been a similar story, but that story back in Mississippi scares me. And it's, it's again, it's teaching our families not to believe what we believe. It's giving them the tools to learn scripture themself, themselves and to support them so that they're not deriving their truth from me as if Sam Peters is 100% on the right track and infallible. The, you know, the best thing I can do for my children is to give them the tools to approach God's word in a faithful way and to read it. The issue in Thyatira is that people were tolerating teaching that was immoral they perhaps didn't have the tools to uh, to uh, contradict it. In the bulletin, there's a, a number of bullet points, or not bullet points, it's actually a list that I think that I would suggest you read through and specifically read through the second list, starting in verse, uh, starting in uh, the bullet point 13. We need to be thoughtful about how we go about seeking truth. In churches, there's splits that happen because certain personalities start fracturing the eldership. They may use vague terms so that when they're questioned, they can back away and say, I didn't really say that. You're, you're reading into my statements. But we know that that's what they meant. Some people can be divisive by playing on the emotions or teaching in secret. Obviously, one of the biggest reasons or the biggest ways to be divisive is to always throw some truth in your position to make it attractive. Again, fracturing, this idea of us versus them is huge. We as a church need to be cognizant of that and not build up any kind of us versus them mentality. Anyways, read through that um, and think through about how we as a church can um, not tolerate this Jezebel figure. I my fourth question of the, uh, the handout is what is a church supposed to do with a Jezebel character? Well, the first thing is to call or to identify a Jezebel. Identify what's happening. Identify the immoral teaching for what it is, and you know it by knowing Scripture. Number two, call it out. And I want to distinguish this between two and three. Number two is to call it out. Number three is to give time for repentance. The text talks about... The, Jesus says he gave time for repentance. Look at verse 21. Jesus is saying, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Number three, first identify, address it, give her time to repent. And number four is pretty much tell her to get lost. Kick her out. And there are many verses in Scripture that talk about avoiding certain divisive people. And let me say this to a church that I would think is doing well, but saying this to a church who is, dealing, who is in a culture that cannot stand intolerance. And the reality is, we cannot tolerate sin within the church. Jezebel is not to be uh, is not to be tolerated. Romans sixteen verses seventeen and eighteen. Paul says as he concludes his epistle, "I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught." He says this: "Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites." And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the, naive, 
of the naive. Paul says, those people that who create obstacles, who are divisive, you avoid them. We might know of the time in 1 Corinthians 5 when a guy has his father's wife, and the issue there at Corinth is they were tolerating it. In fact, it's not just that they were tolerant. If you go back to the text, it seemed they were boasting about it. That's how tolerant they are. They had their flag out in front of the church building. They celebrated it. We're boasting in it. He's saying, hey, and Paul's over here writing this epistle saying, I myself, maybe hundreds of miles away, I've already marked out that person and I'm not going to associate with them. You do the same thing. Do not tolerate flagrant immorality. And he goes on to the end. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 5, 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? It ruins things when sin gets in the church. Verse 13, he says, God judges those outsides. Purge the evil person from among you. Second Thessalonians uh, 3 and verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accordance with the tradition that you have received from us. Verse 14 says this, and notice how the church is supposed to put somebody to shame. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, that's the Apostle Paul leveraging his apostleship, Take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. I remember studying with a relative of mine. I think she, was, she belonged to the Baptist church. And I told her about disfellowship. And again, she was of the opinion that once you're saved, you're always saved. So disfellowship looks very odd, just generally. Why would you ever disfellowship? If you're saved, you're always saved. I mean, there's just some kind of hiccup, or the person was never saved in the first place, so you don't even have to disfellowship them then. And I looked at her and I said, the text says if someone is in immorality, you mark them out and you disfellowship from them. And she said, Sam, that would just shame them. I said, that's what Paul says. He says that they would be put to shame. It's like, yes, this is not something that's pleasant for churches. But that the church at Thyatira was indicted by our Lord and Savior to say, one thing I have against you, you're tolerating this, this character. I wish you would not do it. I've marked her out. She's, I've given her time to repent. She's not. And I'm going to judge her when I come. Let me say two things before I extend the invitation. What kind of metaphor should I use for the church? Are we a, an elite, I don't know, country club of perfectionists who are really good? And, and when, when we see people in sin, we kind of hush-hush and we say, you're not really welcome or your fee is going to increase. I used to go to country clubs when I was in healthcare. It's where we normally ate and we had gatherings. And they're just, you know, very nice. Is that what the church is? It's a country club of elites who kind of push away people who are dealing with sin? That's not the text. Not country clubs and the metaphors used, and this is not original to me, but it's, it's the idea of a, of a, a hospital, of people who are struggling, who want to do better who are honest about their sin. And again, I, if someone comes in here who is cross-dressing, who has same-sex attraction, we welcome you. We want to help. But the moment you say, that's who I am, or that's not going to change, we as a church start saying, we don't tolerate that. That is sin. That needs to be addressed. No, 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 we're not a country club for the elite. We're here to help people. 
we're not here to tolerate sin. And if you're going to be honest about an addiction, something, we want to help you. But the moment you start saying, accept me, accept me in this sin, we have to stand up and not tolerate Je Jezebel. We, uh, we know one day we're going to be judged. The, the, Jesus says here, verse 26, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Brothers and sisters, our task is to grow which Thyatira was doing really well, but also not to tolerate sin. And those who do endure will be handed a reward that we don't deserve, but by the grace of God, he enables us to receive it. Do you want that reward? Are you aware of anything in this church that is, um, that is false teaching? It's just outright false teaching. You're responsible to approach that situation and identify it and tell the person about it. We need to be very careful that we're not tolerating any sin here. If you're not a Christian and you want to become a Christian, um, this lesson was not designed to uh, inspire new faith in Jesus Christ. But I will say, um, as you put your faith your commitment, if you're baptized into Christ, you will also receive that reward if you endure until the end. Um, we want to give you the opportunity. Whatever, however you want to respond, we would love to help you. That's the church we are. We're a hospital. We want to help you. Whatever way we can help, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.